welcome to the uh, ICN2 Nano Seminar Conference. Today is series on nanomaterials. And today we have a very nice invited speaker, and very nice and interesting conference. Uh, our invited speaker is Professor Eric Johansson from Uppsala University. Uh, Professor Johansson did his PhD in physics at the University at the Uppsala University in 2006. Uh, was postdoc at Lund University from 2007 until 2009. And then he worked as a professor in physical chemistry at Uppsala University until 2019. Since then, he is a full professor at the same university. Uh, he has more than 175 publications. Uh, he's aging the 648. He, um, his main research interest in focus on solar cells, as uh, you will see in this talk. He works on fundamental research for new solar cell materials, uh, the usage of solar cells in different applications also. And he's expert on several uh, characterization techniques, for example, uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, XPS, photoelectrochemical uh, measurements, laser pump prof spectroscopy, uh, IR spectroscopy, and also synchrotron spectroscopies. Uh, today, his talk is about the develop development of perovskite and quantum dot solar cells. And usually the way we work with this nano seminar uh, conference is we start with a, a student or postdoc who gives a 10 minute presentation before the main conference. And today what we have is a student from my research group, the Nanostructure Materials for Photovoltaic Energy. Uh, her name is Fanny Bauman, and she will talk about a very nice work that he did, uh, that she did before arriving to our group. Uh, our, our work pub published in Nature Energy about uh, open access database for perovskite solar cells. So before we, we invite uh, Fanny to, to start, please remember if you want to do any uh, questions, you can use the chat at any time of the conference and we will uh, leave the, the, the questions at the end, but please feel free to, to ask uh, the, use the chat. Fanny, if you're ready. Yes. Thank you. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And you can see my screen? Yes, everything is fine. So hi, my name is Fanny Bauman. I am a PhD student at the Nanostructured Materials for Photovoltaic Energy Group here at ICN2. And for this introductory talk, I'm going to present an open access database and analysis tool for perovskite solar cells. I will uh, describe how the Proskag database was created and how it can be utilized by hopefully all of you. So I was a part of this uh, project as part of my master thesis work done at EPFL Lausanne and at Lund University. Um, the database is now online and the release paper was published in Nature Energy this past December, 2021. As you can see to the left here, there are many co-authors to this work, and I would like to thank all of them, and especially Jesper Jakobsson and Eva Unger, who were the coordinating scientists on this project. So the project is based on a problem in that the immense amount of data uh, created by the perovskite solar cell research field needs to become quickly digested and easily accessible. So uh, uh, at the start of this project in mid-2019, there were over 19,000 scientific publications when you search for perovskite solar cell. And that, of course, makes it extremely difficult for a researcher to read all the literature and extract data before uh, conducting their experiments. So what we have done is a global effort to read all the literature that was available and categorize it into a database together with several analysis tool. So this database is open access. It is available to everyone on this webpage that you can see here, here perovskitedatabase.com. And it will provide additional insight to the researchers before doing their experiments, but it can also provide insight to the photovoltaic industry and even create new research output. Additionally, the database can be used together with many modern tools, such as, for example, machine learning. So thanks to the collaborative research uh, efforts of all the uh, 
collaborators on the project, the Perovskite database now contains information from over 19,000 publications and over 42,000 devices with up to 100 parameters. This uh, data has been treated with Python scripts to create interactive graphics and filtering tools. And the database together with all these tools are stored at the Material Zone platform. So here's an overview of the data categories that were extracted from publications. As you can see, there had to be some limits to the extraction and all data possible could never be extracted from each paper. But we hope that these categories, it makes it easy to see and visualize the data as well as make good use of it. So here is just an initial analysis that could be done uh, or an example of that after extracting the data. Uh, to the left, you can see the development of uh, uh, power conversion efficiency over time. And as you can see, there are very much still a distribution of power conversion efficiency reported for uh, perovskite solar cells. If you look to the right in the comparison of record devices, you can see that the global record and the NREL certified record cells are can be compared to different types of devices, such as flexible devices, or for example, cesium lead iodide devices. We could also identify some of the key challenges in the development of perovskite solar cells and visualize this in a nice way. You can see there are a variety of band gaps reported for perovskite. However, some band gaps are, are reported more frequently and show uh, a higher power conversion efficiency. There are clear issues with scalability as most of the cells reported have a very small area. And regarding stability, which is a matter very close to heart in our group here at ICN2, you can see that the uh, advancement from 2016 to 2020 are rather unimpressive and it would be desired to have a steeper curve in the future. I would like to point out that stability data was one of the most difficult parameters to extract from publications, and that it's important to follow consensus statements for the stability assessments, such as the ones that has been published by our group in Nature Energy in 2020. To show you a bit about how the database works, I have created this example graph in the Material Zone platform. So here I'm just comparing the open circuit voltage to the power conversion efficiency. And uh, as you can see, a very nice feature that's actually my favorite is if you hover on, on top of a point, you can extract uh, some additional information from that. But if you click on it, you are immediately transported to the scientific publication from where the data was extracted. And that means that the actual scientific publications are not stored on the database. They are stored just as links together with the parameters that are extracted. And it gives great promise to be able to store all publications that have been uh, published together in the web page. And another reminder again that this web page is free to use for everyone, and it is free to use in any way that anyone might want. Uh, so the only thing you need to do to access the database is to fill out the form that is available on this web page here. And then you'll get an invitation email uh, to access the database. And uh, it's that simple. So here is uh, an image of what it actually looks like when you're inside the database. The, this is the general development tab. And it's, as you can see, there are quite many things going on. And it actually continues for about three more times to the right side of this image. And uh, uh, to simplify a bit, I have uh, done a list here with uh, some things that you can filter on. Uh, and I have made an example where I just filtered on a certain perovskite composition and a certain electron transport layer, in this case, uh, tin dioxide nanoparticles. And then I selected uh, a box selection with efficiencies only over 20, well, between 20 and 25%. And the neat thing is that after I've done the selection, I can now export this to Excel and do further sorting. So, or I can do whatever I want with that information, but I can export a very nice Excel from this. Uh, so these uh, functions are up here to the left and uh, it's very, very, very easy to use. So with that, I would like to 
uh, just um, give some links to where you can use. The most things are on the database. Uh, there you can access the resources, you can join projects use, that are using the database, or you can start your own project that will use the database. There is an effort to try to make sure that people who do the same thing do, do it together. And uh, you can also attend workshops that will be announced on the web page. And if you use the database and you want to cite it, it's very appreciated if you sign the research paper, uh, the release paper, sorry. And if you uh, want to help update the database, that's also very appreciated. And it's also important for your research because if you are visible and your results are visible there on the database, it will get more cited, it will be more visible. And uh, uh, of course, if you see any errors on the web page, there's also a function to correct that. That just takes a minute. And there will also be update efforts to make sure that the project is up and running and uh, really updated for a long time. With that, I'd like to thank all the co-authors. It's almost a bit of a scary <laughs> image here with many faces. Uh, but I would like to specifically thank Anders Hogfeld and Baun Yang, Eva Unger, and Jesper Jakobson for being a big part of me being part of this project. And I would also like to thank my current supervisors, uh, uh, Monica Lira Cantu and Sonia Ruiz Raga, as well as the entire NMP group here at ICN2. And if you have any questions, you are free to contact me on my email uh, regarding this presentation or regarding the database. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fanny. Um, we will leave the questions at the end, but probably you can answer some of the questions that you can see in the chat, OK? So uh, right now, we are going to, to thank you. Very nice presentation, very nice information. And we are going to give um, uh, we are going to welcome Eric Johansson for his uh, for his talk. Thank you very much, Fanny. Thank you. Very nice talk. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Monica, for the nice introduction, and also very thank you very much for the invitation to to having this seminar. Uh, thank you for accepting. Mm -hmm. So yes, so I I will talk a little bit about what we are doing in my research group in Uppsala, uh, especially about the development of perovskite and quantum dot solar cells. Uh, so, so, yes, so my research group is in Uppsala University at Ångström Laboratory. So this is the building uh, in, in, the, in the largest picture here. And um, so we are right now, we're actually moving our lab from one of these buildings to another one. So the activity is a bit low now, but we are hoping to get it running in next month again. And uh, also now it's the building in this uh, big glass building in, in the front of the Ångström laboratory uh, that will also be finished in around uh, one or two months. So if you come and visit, you will, you, it will not exactly look like this. And actually, if we look outside now, it's more like this uh, weather uh, so this is a picture I took yesterday when I was out skiing on the on the lunch break. But it's um, uh, getting warmer also here right now. So in a, in my research group, then what are we doing? So we do mainly fundamental research, like new materials and uh, spectroscopy on these materials to understand the fundamental processes, uh, what is going on when we shine light on the solar cell materials. But then we also do devices uh, based on these materials and also to some extent try to find applications, how to use this in, in future um, yeah, the devices or for example, on buildings, or we also have a project now together with uh, Scania for solar cells on a, on a truck. So spending, we, we spend a rather broad range of topics in, in the group right now. Uh, and there, we are th there are th three PhD students in the group uh, and one researcher and the research engineer. And the, the results I will present today will be mainly based on, uh, on the previous work from uh, our postdocs and PhD students, but also uh, Masoud Karimipur, which is now in Monica's group, actually. So, 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 uh, and some of the new results will also be from the PhD students I have today. 
So starting with the background. So perovskite solar cells, uh, maybe all of you have heard about, but it's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's rather new topic, which was discovered only around 10 years ago. And then it was a breakthrough that, that showed that this material can be a, a very interesting photovoltaic material. And it's especially this um, metal halide uh, perovskites that, that is for this perovskite solar cells. And now the record is over 25% power conversion efficiency for solar light to electricity. And these materials are low cost and the solar cells are easy to make. So that has been a, a big um, revolution, usually it's called in, in photovoltaics. So many research groups are doing research on these materials. Still, as you could see in, in the previous presentation by Fanny, it's, there is problems especially with stability, I think it's the main problem. Uh, so, so there needs to be more development. And also one, another problem could be that it contains lead usually, which is a toxic uh, element. So therefore one has to think about recycling of solar cells or maybe if it's possible to replace lead with other metals. And in the structure of the perovskite solar cell, we have both an N-type semiconductor on one side of the perovskite and the P-type semiconductor on the, on the other side of the perovskite. And we usually build our perovskite solar cells uh, fr from the glass side with the N-type uh, semiconductor first and then the perovskite and the uh, P-type whole transport material and the gold layer. And the reason is that we, we before the perovskites, we mainly did dye sensitized solar cells, which has the same uh, basic uh, structure, device structure, with the titanium dioxide nanoparticles. And the perovskite structure then, it looks like this. And um, we have the ions, which can be cesium, methyl ammonium, or form of medinium in the, in the A position. And then for the B position, we have the metal, uh, which is usually lead, which it can also be replaced by tin, but then uh, it, becomes, it becomes more unstable. So, so lead is the, is the most efficient today. And then we have the halides surrounding the lead uh, center, which is usually iodide, but could also be bromide and to some extent chloride or a mixture of these. And we make the perovskite solar cells from solution in, in our research group. So we have this dissolved salts, uh, and then we deposit this on the titanium dioxide surface and spin coat to get an even layer of the, of the perovskite precursors. And then we heat it up to get the perovskite crystalline structure. And then we deposit the whole transport material and the gold layer. And it looks in our lab, we have this device structure with the small solar four small solar cells on each sample. And uh, of course, one are also aiming towards the flexible perovskite solar cells, since it's possible with the solution-based methods. So I will show some results towards these flexible perovskite solar cells later on. And I think one of the reasons for the uh, explosion in, in, in research that so many researchers work on this topic is that it's easy to make a lot of samples. Uh, so, like you can, it's, you can make this rather easily and you can change some uh, factor in, in the perovskite or the whole transport layer rather easily and make a lot of devices. And what we started with uh, some years ago was to look at the whole transport materials. And that was done in collaboration with KTH in Stockholm. So they synthesized some different molecules and we have tested it in the perovskite solar cells. Uh, and so these molecules, they have a similarity with the standard spiroumatad molecule that is usually used for these solar cells. But we would like to try to find some 
more efficient whole transport material or maybe cheaper uh, compared to the spiral method. So that we, we did rather much work on and uh, tried a lot of different whole transport materials. And they some of them were similar or slightly better than spiral method, but still there was no really big change in, in efficiency. So therefore we have also tried to look into more uh, details about the interface just between the perovskite and the whole transport material to try to understand if it's possible to further um, develop and passivate this perovskite interface to get a better um, contact with the whole transport material and also less recombination at this interface. So for example, one of our more recent work is to modify this perovskite surface by adding a molecule in solution. We spin cut this a solution of one of these molecules and then we heat it up. And then, so the aim was to form some kind of molecular layer on top the uh, perovskite. But when we look at the um, XRD, the X-ray uh, diffraction patterns, then we can see that we actually form another uh, perovskite on, on top of this three-dimensional perovskite we have from the start. We also see some two-dimensional perovskite layer or crystals on, on the surface of the 3D perovskite. So we can see we form these extra peaks in the, you can see these extra peaks in the XRD patterns, which uh, fits with the, with the two-dimensional perovskite structures. So that was the case if we had uh, two of these molecules. For the third molecule we tested, we didn't see this two-dimensional perovskite forming. So here we think it's more like a, a molecular modification of the surface. And the confirmation of formation of this 2D, per, uh, 2D perovskite is from the photoluminescence, where we also can see photo, photoluminescence from this 2D perovskite and the 3D, the normal perovskite also in these two cases, but not in this, the third case. But in all of these uh, three examples, we, we can see an improvement of the solar cell properties. And especially we see an improvement in the field factor. So we get a better field factor and also a slightly higher performance of these devices. So that was, one example with this uh, molecular modification of the, of the surface. And then I will also show an example uh, with the molybdenum disulfide nanosheets on top of the surface. That was done by Masoud Karimipur, which is now in Monica's group. So maybe some of you have seen this example before, but it's, I, I just show it because it's an, a nice example when we add some other type of material as an interface modifier. So in this case, it's a molybdenum disulfide nanosheets. And we can see it on the surface as, a, and they, they seem to agglomerate to some extent on the surface. So we see these agglomerates uh, spread over the surface. But also the, we see some examples of or, uh, smaller uh, nanosheets on the surface. And in addition to these nanosheets, we also have this ligand. It's a dodecanthiol ligand on top of the perovskite surface before applying the uh, molybdenum and disulfide nanosheets. And when we do this surface modification, sorry, so we can see the molybdenum signal in the XPS measurements. So to confirm that we have these nanosheets on the surface, and as I said before, we have some kind of agglomeration of these nano sheets on the surface. And we can see these dots everywhere. And if we compare the device with, with uh, these molybdenum disulfide nano sheets compared to without these, we see an uh, improvement in the device performance. And also when adding this uh, organic ligands, we also see an improvement 
together with, with this molybdenum uh, disulfide nanosheets. And especially we see an improvement in stability. I think that is probably the most important part with this modification. So keeping them in dark for some time, we can see that the, the control device, the standard device, degrades in performance. But when we have these nano sheets on the surface, they show less degradation. Uh, so that is uh, also interesting. And here are some results for the triple uh, cation perovskite. You can see this improvement uh, with this modification. And also for the uh, FAM, the form of medium uh, methyl ammonium uh, perovskite, we get a bit higher performance, but also we see this uh, imp improvement when we have the nano sheets on the surface. And then for the stability in light, uh, Masoud also tested comparing these different devices. And here we see a clear difference compared to the control device without the surface treatment. So when we have these uh, molybdenum desulfide uh, nano sheets on the surface, we, we, we can, the deg degradation is less also in light. And then we also tried this surface modification on flexible solar cells. So the idea was that these nano sheets, maybe it works good uh, also like a surface modification for the flexible devices in, since this might uh, decrease the tension at the surface when we do this, if we, for example, bend this flexible solar cell. And here for the, for the flexible devices, the performance is a bit lower compared to the glass-based devices. Uh, but we can see still the improvement with the, nano sheets on the surface. And when we do this bending test, uh, so bending the device uh, repeated for a, a, a large number of times, we can see that with, with this surface uh, treatment with the molybdenum desulfide nano sheets, it becomes more stable for these bending cycles. So that seems very promising, I think. And another example, what we do for the perovskite in our lab uh, is to, to measure electron spectroscopy and especially XPS or synchrotron-based uh, spectroscopy. And here is one example when we look at energy levels. So for example, this uh, methyl ammonium lead uh, iodide perovskite on titanium dioxide. And here we used uh, high energy X-rays at Bessu in Berlin to measure the energy level structure. So we measure the valence band of titanium dioxide and the valence band of the perovskite. And with, with this high energy X-rays, we can look a bit further into the material. Usually XPS is a very surface sensitive method, but with the high energy X-rays, we get a bit, uh, uh, the results are a bit less dominated by surface contamination. So here we are more sure about that we really look at the perovskite valence structure and the titanium dioxide valence, valence electronic structure. And we can also look into the material. Uh, for example, we, we then see this defect formation of the lead uh, zero. Usually we have lead two plus in the perovskite, but we can also see lead zero when we have this uh, in the perovskite. And as I mentioned before, the lead perovskite might have some problems if we, if we use it on a very large scale, since lead is toxic. And uh, one can think about different ways to solve it. For example, if we can encapsulate it in a good way, maybe that can be a solution. Uh, but uh, the best would be if we can replace lead with some less toxic material, of course. Uh, so we have rather early started to look into new materials that are look uh, like perovskites or perovskite-like materials, other types of metal halides. 
And we started with these bismuth halides, for example, cesium bismuth iodide or methylium ammonium bismuth iodide. And uh, as you can see in this case, uh, we in the first experiments, we, we only reach around 1% uh, power conversion efficiency, which is far away from the lead-based perovskites. But it, is a, it was a starting point anyway, uh, for these type of materials, and and we are trying to trying and struggling hard to improve this um, these materials for for the lead free uh, perovskite like materials. And one of the problems with this um, uh, cesium bismuth iodide is that we have uh, rather low charge mobility. So we, we did some theoretical investigation of these materials. And we can see, if you look at the electronic structure, the case-based diagram, we can see that the mobility is very low for this, for this material. And in addition, we can see that um, the, there is an indirect band gap in these um, bismuth halides. And compared to the lead uh, perovskite, which is a direct band gap material. But anyway, the, the light absorption is still very high in this material, although it's an indirect band gap. And try to, then we try to look into this, uh, if it's possible to uh, obtain a higher mobility. So trying to connect. So here we see the bismuth halide octahedrals. And we can see that they are separated in space. So this, we can, it, it's almost like a zero dimensional material if you look electronically at this material. So we tried to connect this in some way. And our choice was to look in, into addition of silver iodide into this material. So we mix silver iodide and bismuth triiodide. And then it's possible to, to make some other type of structures, uh, which could have a, a bit higher uh, mobilities for electrons and holes. And uh, for these materials, we, we got a higher uh, photocurrent uh, and a bit higher efficiency up to around 2%. Uh, but at the same time, we lose voltage in this system. And we think that it is due to that we form, we, we have formation of more uh, defect states in this material compared to the, uh, to the perovskite material. And we also looked into mixing of halides in this type of silver bismuth uh, halides. So mixing iodide and bromide, similar as we do in the lead perovskite, where we also can mix uh, iodine and bromide to, to change the band gap. So here we see a similar effect when we add bromide, or uh, so, so we get a mixing of iodide and bromide, we can, re we can reduce uh, this, the wavelengths of the, of the light absorption of the material. So we can see a shift of the, uh, the band gap of these materials. So going from iodide to, to mixing in bromide, we get a, a shift of the band gap. And we can also see in the X-ray diffraction pattern, we can see that the bromide actually really mix into the structure. Uh, so we don't uh, form a new phase. So it's, it's really the same uh, crystal phase, but we, we exchange part of the iodides to bromide in this material. And we also looked at this theoretically. And uh, when we do this change of iodide to bromide, the, the electronic structure is, is rather similar. Uh, it's, it's mainly a change of the band gap uh, that we ob obtain. So we don't, we don't see any, the, the mobilities are not so much changed when we do this mixing. So then we also looked into in mixing the bismuth with another metal, so antimony bismuth mixing in this type of material. 
Uh, and again, we can see a change in the band gap of the materials. Mixing in antimony, we also get a higher band gap of this material. And here we could see some improvement in photovoltaic properties, but still uh, the, the efficiency was around still around 2%, maybe a bit higher than 2% for the mixed uh, bismuth antimony uh, materials. So in addition to this uh, uh, silver bismuth halides that I shown, we also have this uh, double perovskites. And then it's also with the cesium ions inside the structure. And this, this structure is more similar to the, the lead uh, halide perovskite. So, so now we have a perovskite structure or a double perovskite with the uh, silver and bismuth metal ions uh, arranged in, in this way. So now it's a, it's a, it's a kind of perovskite structure. Uh, and we have looked into this material a bit more. So this was investigated some, uh, for some years ago by other groups. And now we was a bit interested in looking into this uh, mixing of uh, halide in this type of material. So before it was, it seemed that, uh, that there was a problem when you, when you make this material, you can make the uh, cesium silver bismuth bromide six. Uh, that, is easy, that is rather easy to make a crystalline structure of that material. But if you try to mix in iodide in that structure, uh, you form a separate phase with the pure iodide and pure bromide. So we wanted to look into the possibility if, you, if it's possible to, to get a really mixed uh, halide crystal structure. And the, the way we did that was to start with the pure bromide material and then uh, in a second step add the iodide in methylium ammonium iodide in the IPA and uh, deposit it on, on the surface of this double perovskite and then anneal it. And then we found it was possible to actually get this mixed halide structure also for the double perovskite, which was not, uh, which was not reported before for this uh, larger crystals. There was some results in, in other group had succeeded for very small crystals to form this mixed uh, halide structure, but uh, not for the larger crystals. But here we could we could we found that if we do it in a second step, uh, it was possible. And we could see that the crystal structure uh, changed. So when we add bromide, we get a bit short, shorter bond length uh, in the in the crystal structure from the XRD spectra, which fit with the theory. And we can also see from the light absorption spectrum that we, we, we have this uh, change from the bromide with a high band gap and adding the iodide, we can see a change towards uh, this red, more red colored uh, double perovskite, which also fits with the theory. So we go from a rather high band gap for the bromide, and this is a bit too high. If you would like to use this as a um, solar cell material, the pure bromide, it's, it's, it's a bit too high to really utilize the solar lights. So that was one of the reasons why we wanted to mix in iodide to, to reduce the band gap. And uh, we could get down to around 2.1 uh, or yeah, in the, uh, the direct band, but was, was about 2.1 and the indirect 2.0 electron volts. And when we tried to use some other, um, we also tried to use formamidinium to do this uh, iodide uh, replacement in the structure, but then we, we, it was not possible from the start. And uh, we found that uh, the reason for that it works with the methyl ammonium iodide is that we can, we can also have some 
um, uh, HI in this in in the solvent. So when we when we uh, add HI in this second step, then we have a better um, replacement of uh, of the bromide with the iodide. So that was uh, one of the reasons why why this how this exchange of ions took place. And then we also looked into the possibility to directly use methyl ammonium bromide, also for the pure bromide, uh, to see what happened. Uh, and when we add methyl ammonium bromide, we get a larger crystalline structure. So we do it again in a second step uh, with the methyl ammonium bromide, and we can see we can see this larger crystals forming, which which gives a higher performance of the solar cells. So in that case, we could see an improvement, almost doubling the efficiency for this um, cesium silver bismuth bromide solar cell. So that was uh, some some of our work on the on the perovskites and. I also wanted to show some of the results from our quantum dot solar cells, since that is also, I think, it's a very interesting topic which we do rather much work on in my research group. And uh, we have done mainly the work on lead sulfide uh, quantum dots, which is uh, one of the most uh, common quantum dots for solar cells. And uh, here is one example where we do lightweight and flexible quantum dot solar cells. So using um, silver nanowire electrode on the PEN substrate, uh, which was very thin. And then we add this silver nanowires as an electrode. And we have the lead sulfide quantum dots. Uh, and here for the quantum dots, we, we usually make two layers, one with the lead sulfide um, quantum dots with lead uh, iodide or lead bromide uh, surface ligands, and then a more p-type lead sulfide quantum dot with the EDT layer, and then a gold electrode on top of that. Uh, so in, with this type of structure, we could make this very lightweight and flexible uh, quantum dot solar cell. Uh, and, and the efficiency was still rather high. So almost 10% uh, almost for this uh, type of flexible solar cell. And uh, the main thing to get this to work was to make a very thin and uh, transparent electrode on, on this flexible plastic substrate. Uh, so we used silver nanowires uh, on top of this PN uh, plastic. And we can see that uh, we have this silver nanowires and, and the transmittance was actually very good in this, uh, with this type of silver nanowires. And the, uh, and the resistance was okay for the use in, the, in this type of solar cells. And we could we can uh, we could stretch it and press it together. It wrinkles in a in, in a nice way to to do this to, to form this um, wrinkled small solar cell, and then we can stretch it again several times. And then we also have tried to combine our lead sulfide quantum dots and try to use a bit of our knowledge for the. Uh, perovskite in this quantum dot solar cells also. So we did the ligand exchange with both lead iodide and cesium iodide and annealed this uh, system. Then we, uh, we obtained something uh, which is like a perovskite on the quantum dot surface. And uh, in this case, we, we get a slight change of the light absorption and photoluminescence spectrum with this on top of the 
let's say for the quantum dot. And we could also see uh, in, in the microscopy, we could see the, the formation of these perovskite uh, crystals on, on the quantum dots. And one reason that it could work in this way is that we have a, the crystal lattice for lead sulfide. The lattice distance is very similar to the uh, cesium lead triiodide perovskite lattice. And the solar cells made in this way with the uh, perovskite shell on the, on the lead sulfide quantum dots uh, worked rather not nicely. So uh, around, again, around 10% efficiency. Uh, and one thing that we can see in this case was that when we do the illumination, we see some decay of the, of the performance after some hours in light. And then when we have it in dark, it comes back to the almost the same as we had from the start. Uh, so there seems to be some kind of um, light induced processes that is reversible, um, similar to what, what people have observed also in perovskite solar cells. So I guess it's related uh, to, it could be related to the ion movements that people have seen in, in the perovskite solar cells. And one important part of the quantum dot uh, solar cells is, is, the, is the ligands on the surface of the quantum dots. We would like to have a very um, good surface passivation of the quantum dot. And uh, previously, it was usually done with, um, with which we did in a solid state. So we make uh, the film usually layer by layer. So we, we have these quantum dots with the long carbon ligands from the start, and then we spin cut one layer on, on, the, on the substrate. And then we do the ligand exchange. Uh, we deposit the smaller ligands on top, and then we, we, uh, we spin coat. And then we, do the, we repeat this several times to get the thick quantum dot layer. But some, uh, some years ago, there was a, uh, a new approach where, where, um, where, where we do the ligand exchange instead in solution before depositing the quantum dots. So here we instead we do we have these uh, quantum dots in liquid, and then we have the uh, solution with the uh, with the in this case it was lead iodide and lead bromide ligands, and then uh, we have the phase transfer in solution. So we have the ligand exchange already in solution, and then we take out this these quantum dots and deposit them directly in a thick layer on, on, the, on the substrate. And we have investigated this, this with um, different methods to see that uh, the ligand exchange in solution is usually more efficient. So we get less of these long ligands left if we do it in solution before depositing the quantum dots on the surface. And we also looked at the uh, using XPS uh, or electron spectroscopy, we could also see uh, that this uh, liquid ligand exchange give a better surface of the quantum dots, so less defect states on the surface of the quantum dots. Uh, so here's a, an example of the sulfur 2p spectra. We measured at very low photon energy at the synchrotron. We could one can see very surface, so this becomes a very surface sensitive measurement. So one can really see the surface uh, states on the, on the quantum dots. And when we do the uh, liquid ligand exchange, we have less of these uh, other extra sulfur uh, signals that we can see when we do the solid state ligand exchange. Yes, and uh, Again, we, we have, uh, when we do this in liquid ligand exchange, we have a, a slightly higher performance. Uh, still, 
so in this case, it was 10.7%. Still, the, the quantum dot solar cells are still a bit below the perovskite solar cells in performance. And then for the quantum dot solar cells, we also looked into the possibility to, to make lead-free quantum dot solar cells. Uh, and here we have uh, looked at uh, and, um, silver bismuth sulfide. And the, there you have all, you, you have, uh, I think the, the, the original of this work comes from uh, Professor Constantino's group in, in Spain. So, so, but we have looked into this work and tried to try to also do a similar type of lead-free quantum dot solar cells. And what we did in this work was to, to see when we make these quantum dots, um, if we really have what we expect when we, when we do, since now we have three different um, uh, precursors in, in this, um, uh, when we make these quantum dots, and we would like to see then if we really get what we expect when we add, when we make these quantum dots. So we added different amount of silver precursor uh, and measured the, what we have, the, um, the composition of these quantum dots by XPS. And we could see that when we, yeah, for, for some concentration of precursors, we get the, the correct uh, stoichiometry of, of the, of the quantum dot. But for, yeah, from, uh, for, for other, when we have uh, what we think maybe is the best um, ratios in the solution, we, we don't get the correct stoichiometry in the quantum dots. And we can get both silver rich if we have a lot of silver added or bismuth rich if we reduce the silver addition. And we could see that when we have this almost, um, the, the correct stoichiometry, we get also the best performing solar cell in that case. And uh, uh, another technique to look into how, how these quantum dots work uh, when we shine light on them is um, to do time-resolved electron spectroscopy. So here we have a laser pump that uh, excites the quantum dot. And then there is a, a XUV probe light so that we measure the electron spectra. So with this probe light, we, we shine on the sample after the laser pump, and then the electrons are uh, emitted from the sample, and we, we take them with an electron analyzer, and we can uh, measure the kinetic energy of the outcoming electrons. <clears throat> so we can see the, in, in, if we look at this picture, we have the different the time scale on, on the y-axis. So here at zero femtoseconds, uh, the pump pulse comes in and then we measure what happens after this pump pulse. And if, if we look at the spectra below this, uh, this one, we, we had the electron counts. So this is the electron spectra, where we see the valence band of the uh, quantum dot. Um, electrons, and then we can see the excited electrons. So for, for the yellow line, we can see after 15 femtoseconds, we have excited electrons from the, from the valence band to the conduction band in the quantum dot. And then we can see the relaxation of these excited uh, or hot electrons in the quantum dot when they relax down to, to the lowest energy state in the conduction band. So this is, uh, I think, an interesting method to learn more about what happens really in the quantum dot on a on a short time scale, and how the electrons are distributed in energy after when after this short uh, excitation pulse. So this we will continue also to look into. So this was for lead sulfide this experiment, and we will see how this is looks like for other quantum dot materials if it looks the same and how their electron rel relaxation looks like. Yes, and finally, I will present some 
results where we combine our perovskite and quantum dot solar cells in tandem cells. And in, in this uh, example, we, we make a four terminal tandem cell. So that is essentially having the perovskite solar cell with a semi-transparent back contact and then the lead sulfide quantum dot solar cell uh, taking up, up the infrared light passing through the perovskite solar cell. So with the perovskite solar cell, we aim to uh, use the visible light or up to 800 nanometer and with the quantum dot solar cell around 800 to 1100 nanometer light. And they have both, they have um, separate contacts, these solar cells. So one can measure the efficiency of them separately. And to make this to work, one has to, the, the contact of the perovskite solar cell has to be semi-transparent. So some of the infrared light has to pass through the perovskite solar cell. And we, the way to solve this in, in our, in this case, we did a very, a very thin gold electrode. So just making the gold layer very thin, we can see that it's, it's semi-transparent. And if we look at the transmittance of light, uh, it is around 35% uh, or 30% in, in this wavelength range. So it's, it's not the perfect transparent contact, but it's, uh, it works uh, as a, a testing system for, to, to see if, how this tandem cell works. And here are uh, the IV curves for the perovskite solar cell and the uh, lead sulfide quantum dot solar cell. So the blue line is the perovskite front cell and the, uh, the red line is the quantum dot solar cell without the perovskite solar cell. And then we have the green line is when we have in the tandem cell with the perovskite and the quantum dot cell. So this is the quantum dot part. Uh, and the reason that it becomes much lower is that because we, we have much lower light hitting the uh, quantum dot solar cell since most light is uh, taken up by the perovskite solar cell. And we can see from the IPC the, uh, or the EQV spectra, the incident photon to current conversion efficiency for different wavelengths. We can see that the, uh, the perovskite solar cell, we have, a, it, we have a photocurrent up to around 800 nanometer. And for the quantum dot solar cell, it it's extends up to around 1100 nanometer. And then when we have in the tandem cell, we measure the quantum dot solar cell, we can mainly see the contribution for the photocurrent in this uh, infrared region since most light is absorbed by the perovskite solar cell. And in this combination, um, we, when we do this tandem cell in this way, we get around 19 to 20% total, total efficiency, uh, which is actually a bit lower than our best perovskite solar cells. Um, but I think it's an interesting concept. And if we, in theory, it should be, we should be able to uh, reach much higher if we can make a better transparency of the context of the perovskite solar cell. Uh, so this is something we also are developing at the moment. So yes, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and maybe you have some questions for this work also. Thank you very much, Eric. Very nice, very interesting work and uh, you have made a lot. I was I'm very impressed with your tandem solar cells. Congratulations. And we have um, many questions. Let's uh, start. Um, let's just start with uh, thanks. Oh, with Sonia. Thanks for, for the nice talk. I have a question about the cesium bismuth and silver bismuth materials. Do you think that the charge mobility will be improved? by optimizing the materials or is an intrinsic property as per your calculations? 
Yes, I think it's an intrinsic property of these materials. The the um, mobility, if we when we do the calculations, we can see that the mobility is much lower for these materials, um, uh, at least for the materials that we have investigated so far. Uh, that we have the um, if we look in the key space, we can see the the mobility uh, is much lower, and it's partly because of the yeah the the structure um, when we have the for example the double perovskite with the silver bismuth double perovskite with the cesium then uh, we don't have the same type of um, orbital overlap with the silver and bismuth uh, like we have for the lead based system so we don't see the same dispersion in the bands with, with this silver and bismuth Base systems, but um, yeah, I, it could be there could be some materials with different structures, or if we find another uh, combination of metals that could work better. Okay, <clears throat> there's another question. This one is from Fanny. She says, "Thank you for the nice talk about the bismuth halide system. What, in your opinion, is the reason for the change?" In band gap, do you also think it could be a local phase crystal separation like on the double perovskites, or is it is the same crystal all around with different dimensions? Okay, now I didn't. And you see the question? Uh, no, okay, okay, I will check in the chat here. Um, okay, now I see it, yes. Um, From Fanny. Mm -hmm. most Uh, so, so the, uh, the the change in the band gap when we change the halides um, uh, so, so it's I mean we can also see it when we do the calculations it it uh, we, it follows the calculations very well so I I don't think it's a local effect it's this um, effect of when we change from iodide to bromide or have a mix of iodide and bromide, uh, we can see the, the change of the mainly the HOMO or the, the valence band position. So when we add bromide, uh, the, the valence band is a bit lower and we, when we have more iodide, the valence band is a bit higher. So that will change the band gap and, and then uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so that's the main reason, I think. So it's not a local effect, I think. Okay. There are questions in the Q&A uh, section. Eric, if you want to see them. The first one is from Jack Milhew. He says, thank you for the nice talk. I have two related questions. What is the main mechanism for perovskite solar cell degradation? And then why does the inclusion of Molybdenum sulfide increase stability. Yes, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, the stability that's the, the key point I think for the perovskite solar cells. That's the, if you can if you can find that um, if you can avoid that, that would be the very good I think. Um, and uh, at least one of the degradation processes is that we form the lead iodide. So we have loss of uh, iodide in the perovskite, and that can be part. That can be due to many reasons. Uh, one can be reactions with the materials that is at the interface, um, and also if we have defects of the perovskite uh, that can transport iodide, uh, that can be. I mean, the the degradation will be quicker. If you have many defects, that can the iodide, I think, at least will transport quicker through the perovskite and the degradation will be quicker. So I think um, so by um, avoiding defect states at the surface should uh, retard the, the degradation of the perovskite. Uh, so, and I think that maybe what when we add this surface. Uh, ligands and the molybdenum disulfide, maybe we reduce the defects of the surfaces and that could in turn then 
reduce the degradation speed of the perovskite. Okay, thank you. There's another question from Diego Jetaku. Uh, Regarding the binding from uh, for perovskites, what is the radius used in the test? Okay, yes. Uh, yes, I don't remember now. Um, maybe, yes. So, uh, uh, so maybe you can say, yeah, I, I need to look this up. Or maybe if Masood is on the <laughs> chat, maybe he can also, because he did this measurement. He says two millimeters. Okay, two millimeters. Great. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other questions? Uh, because I have a few. <laughs> um, not too many, but I will ask. Very interesting when you when you synthesize a, like a nanoparticle, a quantum dog with a shell of the perovskite, uh, and you talk about uh, ion movement. So were you able to block this iron movement? Were you able to immobilize this? Or did you see any changes with, without the, the shell? Um, so so we, we see this kind of, um, so like, like I showed in the, in the presentation, we, we see this effect when we, uh, with, with the time. So we see after some time, we see some change of the photovoltaic properties. Uh, but we were not able to change that uh, in some way. So I don't know how to avoid it in a way. That's, um, I okay. guess it, it is, uh, I, I would guess it is a similar thing to what happens in the perovskite when you mm -hmm. have defects that the ions are moving uh, from, from uh, one side to the other side when, we, when, mm -hmm. when you have some voltage over the device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And another question I have is, uh, you mentioned only for whole transport materials with um, similar structure than a, sp a spiral. And uh, you also mentioned the use of uh, um, self-assembled monolayers using additives uh, or organic molecules, right? How do you, I mean, I saw that you use amino groups. Why do you use amino groups and how do you select those amino groups? So how do you select that the, the, what do you take into account to select that kind of molecule, the size, the type, and, and the functional group? Uh, do you mean when, when you made this surface um, with, the two, with the 2D perovskites? Uh, yes. Um, so, yes, when we were shooting these, these molecules, we were thinking to find something that would fit to the perovskite surface and that's the reason why we chose the amino groups from the start uh, and then we would we thought about uh, having a series with uh, some small modifications to see uh, what happens when we modify this uh, group so mm, yeah we, have, we are actually trying we, we have tried also other molecules uh on the surface uh both that are that didn't work as good and also some some of that that could be even more promising okay. um but yeah um it, it's it's mainly to 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 test and try and to have some kind of series where we can do some sy systematic variation okay um, have you tried have you tried to measure the uh the effects the passivation of the effects or the effect density after using these additives or this uh, functionalization? Yeah, we have tried to measure it uh, by um, uh, both electronically and, and also, I mean, in the fluorescence spectra, there, there, there we, it says something about the defect. I mean, we have a higher fluorescence uh, after doing the surface modification. So okay. that uh, I think points to that we have fewer defects, but then we have also tried to measure it electronically, um, both measuring lifetime in the complete devices, lifetime of the electrons and holes in the complete devices, and also doing some impedance spectroscopy. Okay. Uh, and we see some, uh, yeah, at least from, uh, impedance is always difficult to interpret the results. 
but it, it points towards that it's less defects on, on the surface when we do these treatments. Okay. I will be very interested to measure some stability on your devices if you're interested. That would be yeah, nice. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about it. Okay, if there is not any other uh, question, um, you, you feel free to contact Professor Johansson with any yes. other comments directly by email or ask us and we connect you with him. Uh, we, we are very happy to have you here. I'm very glad to see you after so many times. I think I yeah. saw you before the pandemic. Yes, yes. So very happy to you're here. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation and I hope to see you soon. Yes, okay. thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, Thank you, thank you very much, much, Eric. And we we'll keep in touch uh, by email. Yes, yes, great. Okay. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.